Hey guys, um, so I know it's been a while since we filmed anything, but we're currently uh, about to try something we wanted to try for a while. Uh, we're headed out to the Arboretum, and we're going to try using the uh, the masks uh, to control the gateways. We're with Nigel. What do you want me to say? What's up? Um, I'm just introducing the video, basically. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's what, that's what we're doing. <laughs> you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Michael falls out the window and dies. <laughs> yeah, the, the car fell with you. Oh, wait. No, it's not. I had, uh, I had it on this one. And oh, no. Smoke oh, no. And it was just killing me. Right before I don't know my throat right now, but yeah, actually. Oh, no. All right, you guys ready? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. So, um, you're gonna want to grab onto one of us once we like, actually put these on. I I'm gonna like wait until the camera reaches like peak distortion, essentially. Yeah. And then uh, <coughs> once you do that, we'll put them on, and that works. Usually, like the point where we like get sent somewhere. I'm pretty sure it's around the middle of it. Why don't you give me this one? Because that's where it is. <laughs> it is anxiety inducing to see you holding that. Yeah, but as far as we know, when you're like that, you have the ability to control that, so. Nigel! Where are you guys? Where's that mask I had? anything on the camera. Alright, my flashlight and my shot. Oh fuck. This is that beach again. From all the way back in fucking 2018, this is that beach. The beach from when Paul died. I'm not exactly stoked to be here, quite frankly. I'm gonna stop recording for now, save battery. I've been recording for like, I don't know, seven fucking minutes, so I'm gonna save my battery for now. I'll get back to you guys if I haven't gone home yet. So yeah, uh, James Okran out of here, fellas. Uh, let's see what the fuck is going on now. What kind of evil is afoot? Let's see here. No! No!
That's the funny part. I go home. I want to see my mom again. It's gonna be temporary. I know it. Ah, uh, she fucking thought she'd keep my dad from me. But I know the truth now, mom. I know the truth. Okay. I just watched that last fucking bit. I don't know what the fuck I was saying. None of that makes any fucking sense. You guys will see soon. But there's nothing about my dad that I know. Robert mentioned what happened, but that's it. I barely know anything about the guy. Mom's always kept him from me. I've never known. What the fuck is this place? I need to get the fuck out of here right now. There's so much to figure out. Eric! Eric, come on! Oh god, not now! Fuck! I just... What? what? <laughs> Where are we? I, I don't know, I just... I just ran into you. What? He, you, you, you were wearing the mask out there. I, I don't know how. He's, he's been here. I... Yeah, I... What? I've been with the whole time. I don't know, there must have been some, like, time shenanigans or whatever. What? Where? When? I was out in that field. But like, where geographically is here? I don't know. When, when we want to leave, we can use the masks to get out. Does, does it, is there a time factor in this, or is it only a rotation? Well, uh, Are we in the same time period? That's been known to be undependable. <laughs> Do you know if we're going to be able to get out? Yeah. Um, <coughs> if, we, if, we, if we use the mask here, then we'll get out that way. And even then, I've gotten sent home. Somehow, I mean, judging there. by this place, like, it looks like a lot of people didn't get out. Well, no, but I mean, like, looks like somebody lives here rather to me. Yeah. Maybe. No, my point is like, it's can't be like this. We're not like thousands of years in the past or anything. Yeah. Right. This but is modern, obviously. Future. I don't know what the fuck. Is going on. He's wearing the same clothes when he had the mask on as he is now. So what no, I think Eric? is, yeah. Like, it has to be recent, when I, like, jumped or whatever. I don't know. Oh, okay. Whose backpack is that? I don't know, but it looks a lot like that one that I found at Far Better. It looks water. You should grab it. Yeah. <laughs> I love stealing from homeless people. Yeah, North Bay. That's, this is, that's from our time. Yeah. yeah. So I think we are in the present. Okay, should we?
Yeah. Uh, did you guys hear that? Hear what? Okay. That thing is close. Put the mask on. Grab him. What? Okay. That worked. Oh. I right. can't believe that worked. I don't think he's going to be very happy that we uh, exploited his uh, trade secret. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> Let me just throw up. <clears throat> so, uh, is this thing on? Yeah, it looks like it. Looks like it is. <coughs> testing, testing, one, two, three. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Jeffrey Ogren. I'm 15. It's currently August 10th, 1983. And I'm just kind of recording this because Dr. Beckenberg told me to. It was my first time going to the Brooklyn Behavioral Therapy Center. And he just kind of told me that I could get a grip on my anxiety and my hallucinations a little easier if I began recording my thoughts whenever I felt it necessary. For as long as I can remember, I've had tremendous bouts of inexplicable anxiety, along with a really consistent hallucination. A white guy in a suit. Well, let me rephrase that. A really tall white guy in a suit. I've nicknamed him Pencil Nick. The hallucinations vary at times. I recall at a really young age seeing what looked like if the aforementioned big guy was naked, short, had scoliosis, had a face, with big ass teeth by the way. Anyway, he also said it would help with my instances of memory loss, which is cool. I'm not really feeling that much that I really want to tape about right now. I'm feeling pretty normal currently. I can tell some of these entries are going to be months apart. I don't really have any big incidents too terribly often, but when I do, it's really bad. So I'm just going to tape whenever I feel it necessary. Anyways, I'll get back to this at some point. October 20th, 1983. Smoked up with Dylan for a bit of this place after school. He had a theory back in ninth grade when I told him about my life and everything that we could help lower my anxiety and even numb out my hallucinations. At the time, I thought he just wanted to get buzzed with me more often, but today, I decided I'd put it to the test. After noticing Pencil Nick standing in his dad's bedroom, I decided I wouldn't run. Instead, I told him to pass me the bong. He didn't know I was having an episode, so he must have been pretty confused by my urgency, but I needed more than a buzz to see if this worked. It didn't make the guy go away, really. It just made me not have severe tinnitus when in a certain radius of him. January 19th, 1984. Well, hallucination blackouts are always fun when they're on exam day. Had to book it out of school yesterday because I noticed pencil neck at the end of the hallway. His arms were outstretched at about 45 degrees, short of pointing straight up. It was like he was trying to block me from going any further. His extra arms pointed straight out to block the space between his legs and arms. Even though he stayed in this position, he appeared to slide towards me. The lockers he passed by forcibly swooshed open, only to slam back shut. I remember as I left the school sho shoving the hall monitor into a poorly constructed popsicle stick physics class diorama of a bridge on my way out. It looked like I had jumped to an exact 12 hours ahead. It was suddenly nighttime as I went outside. I found myself in the middle of the street, and just before being turned into tomato soup by a speeding delivery truck, I felt something push me away. Not the truck. It came from my right side, the same direction as the school I had just left. An all-black, scrawny, multi-jointed appendage with a gaunt white hand had saved me from being pummeled into oblivion. Instead, it pummeled me to some poor sap's parallel parked car. Before I blacked out, I felt several goopy black and almost dark purple mollusk-like appendages wrap around me, completely concealing me. My eyes eventually being covered by them seemed to translate into having blacked out. Great. Now I have to spend my Saturday retaking my exam. What's even better is that when I woke up in my bed the next day, my mom asked me if I was out smoking the devil's lettuce. Funnily enough, if she had asked that a week ago, today she would have smelled it on me. Or somehow the only thing that actually quells my anxiety is the exact thing she'd kill me for. <sighs> Damn you, Ronald Reagan! 
July 6th, 1984. I hadn't really needed to record anything for a while. Things kind of seemed to slow down relating to all this until last night. I had a nightmare wherein I wasn't exactly in control of my actions. Come to think of it, I think this dream was from another perspective of someone else. Anyways, whoever I was in the dream, I started in a confined room. A cell. This wasn't a prison, though. This looked more akin to a mental hospital. I'd gotten up and used absolute brute strength to bash the door open. Whoever I was seeing the perspective of, I'd like to see how ex absolutely ripped they must be. I still appeared to be wearing the patient attire. As I exited, I noticed that even though I could hear the schizophrenic shouting and sobbing and the other patients doing their whole crazy person shtick, I couldn't really see any patrolling guards. There were these really cool futuristic looking, looking CCTV cameras in the corners but they looked like they were deactivated. I headed up a flight of stairs and walked up to a specific cell. Inside, there was a middle-aged man who sat in a wheelchair full of fixtures to assist in keeping him healthy, including, but not limited to, a gastrointestinal feeding tube, an oxygen tank, water going through an IV tube, etc. I smashed down the door, and as I got closer to the vegetative man, I noticed something that really got to me. He had my eyes. I couldn't place it on the rest of his face, but his upper face resembled mine to a ridiculous extent. I'm not sure if this guy is like future me or my future brother or some wackadoo concept like that, but it disturbed me nonetheless. It made it even harder to watch whoever wasn't in control of my body. I watched from meticulously disconnect his tubing, leaving him breathless, starving, and dehydrated. As I exited the room, things suddenly changed. Everything looked significantly older than before. The rest of the dream had me going through the area, slaughtering everyone inside, somehow taking gunshots from policemen and not even feeling anything or flinching. I was using some kind of machete, and I was wearing a mask of some kind. I remember after I got done slaughtering everyone I could see, I went outside through these huge-ass double doors that were wide open for me. They looked like barn doors almost. As I exited, I saw the sign that said, Lumber Hills Mental Hospital. Waiting beyond the sign, standing perpendicular to my path exiting the hospital, was Pencil Neck. He didn't seem to be trying to hurt me, though. He didn't even seem like he was trying to scare me. This easily was the most human he's ever looked to me. He just stood there, with fairly normal bodily proportions despite his height and narrow frame, head slightly tilted as I looked towards him, dripping in red. As I reach him, everything goes dark all of a sudden. A bizarre, disharmonious choir of what sounds like tiny compressed flutes that almost sound sickly in a weird way begins to drone in the background as the dream turns into a fast-paced slideshow of text. The messages that I made out were Eric, Perspective, Persona, Transfer, Director, Avatar, Use, New, and 2017. After this, I suddenly went back to being in a cell from the beginning of the dream. I wasn't wearing the mask or holding my machete. I was just sitting there, leaning my head against the wall. Surrounding my cell was the sound of fleshy meat gyrating in the grotesque fashion. The hallways I can see through the cage door are too dark to see anything in. It's all simply empty. Just across from the gate, on the other side of my cell, stands a girl, who looks to be about 17 or 18. She wore a green shirt and had what brown and dyed red medium-length hair. She stood there with a box and placed it down on the ground before saying, Hey, old pal, it's time we got started. You have a lot of work to do. This is when I woke up. I don't know who this Eric person is, but that entire dream isn't all that I'm worrying about. When I woke up, I found that my window was wide open. That and someone recorded a message on my tape recorder while I was sleeping. It was the only other thing that seemed out of place when I woke up. Someone broke into my house. October 2nd, 1984. Some weirdo in all black clothing was watching me on campus today. Kept filming me with a Super 8. Dylan and I tried to corner him, but he disappeared before we could reach him. November 9th, 1984. I was coming home from work at the bodega down the road from campus when I saw the guy in all black from school. He was standing on my roof. In fact, he was right outside the window that goes into my fucking bedroom. Of course, the creep was gone by the time I got into my bedroom to go into the roof. <sighs> 
March 4th, 1985. Dylan's dead. I think that pencil neck has something to do with it. There's so many coincidences here. I was in the bathroom today, and I suddenly felt pencil neck lurking nearby of me. Whatever he did must have been really strong, because it took me out instantly. I remember there was a moment of pain where I felt my temple ram against the goddamn toilet bowls like crumpled to the floor before blacking out entirely. By sheer coincidence, Dylan was at the urinals at the time, and I suppose pencil neck was after him. He had died by asphyxiation. Scratch that, his, fo his throat was fucking crushed. Crumpled like a piece of paper. It looked more like an apple core than a throat. I was still out when they found him. But I hope that gangly bastard is scared because he made a bad fucking move by killing the person I've been best friends with since I first moved into the city. I hope you're fucking trembling, you toothpick limb piece of shit. You fucked with the wrong person. March 9th, 1985. Dylan's funeral was today. You'll never guess who pulled me aside to talk while I was there. The weirdo creep ass who was filming us at school. He pulled me aside and told me his name was Robert. Now that I saw him up close, I could see what he looked like. He almost looked like an Emperor of Palpatine, but with brown matted hair that hung down to his shoulders. He said his official title is the Beholder, and that he has a duty to stop Pencil Neck, or as he called him, the Director, from terrorizing the innocent. He told me he watches people like me to get to know Pencil Neck's me next move. I asked him if he's keeping watch over the people to protect them 24-7, then why didn't he fucking do something to save Dylan? Then the fuck had disappeared when I glanced over at the crowd in front of the tombstone. Of course, the proud martyrs always prove poof out of existence when the bluff is called. Anyways, I'm going to take a break from these, like, for a while. Trying to do with high school life without Dylan around has been rough on me. I don't really know that many people other than him. I'll only record if something big happens to me, and even then I'll have to think twice about it. June 6th, 1986. It's been a while since I've picked this thing up. Like, over a year. With that, a lot has changed with me. The main thing is I'm about to graduate, and got accepted to NYU, which is insane. I'm hoping to major in journalism, and I plan to go into the Navy after college. During the past year, I've seen both Robert and Pencil Neck around every now and then, but it hasn't resulted in anything bad happening. Anyway, I doubt I'll be able to record anything while I'm in school, because I'm going to really try to work as hard as possible here, and then I probably won't have time to record while I'm in the Navy, so I think I'm probably just going to be swearing this whole audio log thing off for good. It's helped me in the past to an extent, but I'm past it now. I think. April 10th, 1995. God, it's been years, man. I just found this thing in an old box in my garage. It's so surreal to even record my voice like this again. I just figured I'd record something for old times' sake, you know? So, where to start? College went great. I majored in journalism, and then I joined the Navy. And I've got to say, seeing the world live like that, and just living in so many new places was a very enriching experience. Good stuff. After I came back home, I got a job as an investigative journalist for the New York Observer. It's been awesome. I've enjoyed being back in the place I call home. And it's cool to record that, just to get closure on what life was like for me earlier. Side note, I've only seen Pencil Neck like three times in the past nine years. Isn't that crazy? Anyways, I should probably get back to cleaning out the attic. But I just thought it'd be cool to record something for old time's sake. Oh God, okay, calm down, Christ. Okay, so I was interviewing someone for work. I can't even remember his name now. When I was done, I was leaving through this elevated hallway with these big windows on the sides and Pencil Neck ran his fucking tendrils through it. He tried to grab me, fuck. Now that I'm recording this, I know getting in the car was a mistake. That thing's beginning to submerge my car. I... <coughs> Fuck.
pretty spare change, mister. Hey, man, I'm freezing out here. Get off of me! I just woke back up. I listened to the tape when Pencil Neck spit it out of his mass of tendrils. There isn't any way to deny it any further. Pencil Neck has been causing me to kill people without me knowing. I just fucking beat this homeless person to death. I suppose this means I killed Dylan all those years back. Explains why my neighbor's dog from when I was seven. I don't know if he's using me as a puppet for his will or if I just have some kind of multiple personality disorder that he triggers. But I know that the fact that Pencil Neck is in my life makes me a fucking monster. I'm moving out of New York. I'm moving across the country. And I hope maybe I can leave Pencil Neck here. If that doesn't work, I'll have to spend the rest of my life as an involuntary killer. I hope maybe I can start fresh when I move. We'll have to see what happens. September 9th, 1996. I'm finally out of New York. For a month I've been living in Bellingham, a small bayside town in Washington. Secluded enough, but still gets its fair share of visitors and tourists. On one of my first days living here, I met a girl who I've gone absolutely heads over heels over. Her name's Annie. Annie Singer. She's studying English literature at Western Washington University. As soon as we met, we instantly clicked. I swear, sometimes it's like she knows exactly what I'm about to say. We've been around each other a lot recently, and I think we can really make someone special. In other news, I've taken up a job as a writer for the Bellingham Herald, which is a lot more lax than New York Observer, but still kind of hard to make things work. Bellingham's been lots of fun, though, and so far it looks as though Pencil Neck has been able to trace me. I think I'm going to be okay. February 5th, 1997. You're never gonna guess who I ran into today. You ready? Three, two, one, here it goes. Robert! That whacked out weasel thought he could sneak into my life again. The bastard was sitting in the back of my car somehow and desperately tried to tell me shit like, the director does not forget and the longer you wait, the more he'll be able to do and allow me to guide you to salvation. I told the bastard I'd slit his throat if I found him rummaging around my business one more time. Just like that, he was gone before I knew it. I swear, they're nervous, some people. They can be so fucking persistent sometimes. I'd like to maybe not join you and your shit swizzling shuckle jerk mates on Hafschlein Island, Robert. Ask again on a different day, sure. Like that'll fucking help your miserable plight. Give me a break, you people are fucking insane. March 13th, 1999. It's been a while since I picked this thing up. I wanted to get a record that today, on March 13th, 1999, I proposed to Annie. Better off, she said yes. I'm absolutely amazed at how well this turned out. I'm hoping life goes well for us in the future. I'm extremely hopeful for when we share our lives with each other. October 8th, 2000. Well, I've been seeing pencil neck around a lot late recently. Other than that, married life is going swimmingly. We have a house together now, and just the other day, she told me she was pregnant. <laughs> God, I can't wait to be a father. The only thing I fear is the fact that Pencil Neck might go after our child. But I'll make sure that doesn't happen, even if it kills me. July 2nd, 2001. I haven't been completely honest with myself on these tapes. I acted like nothing was wrong. Like I could be a real husband. A real father. I was such a fucking fool. So short-sighted and naive. In reality, the director's been wrecking my shit for the past year. My sleep killing has been getting more and more frequent. It seems almost like every night I get up and go do some horrendous act of murder. I started getting memories from these times somehow. They remind me of that dream I had. I remember how I saw Robert doing one of them. Tried to take his head off. He didn't call me Jeffrey. 
he called me Pursuer. Odd one he is. I saw him pretty recently, and he inspired me to do what I'm about to do. I've been storing the bodies in my shed behind my house. The stench gets worse every time. The ones at the bottom of the sticky pile of wasted flesh have become totally unrecognizable. The weight of the rest of the corpses disfigured a lot of them, and they easily get more maggots than others. Annie's going to go into labor any one of these days. Robert showed up at my house last week. I wasn't even angry. He told me that I was too late. I couldn't fix things anymore. He said he wanted me to replace him as the Beholder, but as I turned to becoming the Director's Death Totem, which he called the Pursuer, it was a lost cause, and as I was already an avatar of something else. But he told me there was one last thing I could do to fix it. Turn myself in. He informed me that as long as I'm out and about killing the innocent, James is in danger. Annie's in danger. I need to put myself in one place where Pencil Neck will have no use for me. Prison, where a serial murder like me would end up. I thought back to the dream I had as a teenager. The one about the Eric guy. Being in a cell didn't stop him, so why should it stop me? That was when Robert informed me of the mechanics of how the Pursuer worked. He told me the Pursuer was an avatar Pencil Neck chose. He didn't necessarily possess those he picked, but he did a trigger shift in them. Along with granting them insane strength and durability while they're in that state, the mind that they move with was primal in nature. Something repressed from an early era. The Pursuer has an instantable urge to do nothing but make its surroundings exactly how Pencil Neck's hive mind orders it is. And with the Pursuer's abilities to kill, maim, torture, and warp around places through time and space effortlessly, that's pretty easy for it. He told me that if it became difficult or demanding to use as a pawn, or did something so heinously against it that it didn't want me as a tool, Pencil Neck would choose someone else, a new Pursuer. Well, tonight I took Robert's advice. I called the police and told them to come here so they can arrest me. I informed them that I have a shed full of bodies and can't keep trying to hide. I told them about how I just want to be free of killing people. Pencil Neck stood over there in the corner of the room as I spoke. He tilted over very slightly, droopy and looking sad, uh, like a wet cotton swab. I swear it was like that thing was trying to guilt trip me for throwing away all those years we've spent together. Yeah. Yeah, well, fuck you too. I didn't even told Annie about what I did to fix this. She's asleep in the other room right now. I hope she has the courage to tell James about me. I wish I could see James. I wish I could look at how much he resembles me. I wish I could guide him through the world and shield him from Pencil Neck. I wish I could help him avoid Pencil Neck, but I suppose this is the best thing I could possibly do for him. The cops should be here any minute now. They'll come, they'll take me away, and they'll clean out the shed. I hope James learns about me, and when he does, I hope he feels something similar to what it would have been like for me to be there. I love you, James Okren. Wherever you are in life, when you end up hearing this, I'm so proud of you. Goodbye.